Our first two speakers are Laurie Taylor, Laurie Taylor, who is the Senior Director for Library Technology and Digital Strategies at the University of Florida. She provides leadership for technology and partnerships within the university libraries and across the university, regionally, nationally, and internationally. Speaking with her is Ellen Huet, who is the European Studies Librarian also at the University of Florida. She is the chair of the Florida Digital Humanities Consortium, a collective of institutions in Florida that seek to promote an understanding of the humanities in light of digital technologies and research. And Laurie and Helen, their paper is entitled Generous Thinking to Meet Community Needs with the Digital Library of the Caribbean. Welcome. It's so nice to be here uh, with everyone today. Um, I'm Laurie Taylor. I'm the Senior Director for Library Technology and Digital Strategies at the University of Florida. And I'm presenting um, with a colleague on uh, generous thinking to meet community needs with the Digital Library of the Caribbean or DLAC. Hi everyone, and I'm Hélène Huet, and I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I am the European Studies Librarian at the University of Florida, and I'm looking forward to this presentation. All right, this image here is from our Open Education Resources site. In May 2019, over 30 educators, scholars, and librarians came together for a week-long institute to collaboratively explore the potential and the limitations of digital pedagogies within Caribbean studies. Hosted by the University of Florida and the Digital Library of the Caribbean, um, Migration, Mobility, Sustainability, Caribbean Studies and Digital Humanities, included a multi-institutional international group of participants working throughout the Caribbean and the United States. Participants delved into digital humanities projects, amplifying community narratives across the Caribbean diaspora, low barrier tools to enable student instructor co-creation and efforts to subvert colonialist legacies as we build and describe digital collections. The Institute emphasized relationship building, lived experience, empathy, and flexibility as foundational values grounded in feminist approaches to teaching and technology. This presentation relies on these values as a framework for unpacking one major goal of the Institute, the creation and collection of open educational resources as described in the funded proposal to the US National Endowment for the Humanities, following the in-person institute, participants engage in a year long series of virtual workshops and teaching within their own institutions, culminating in a web publication. Alongside teaching resources, such as lesson plans, syllabi, student driven exhibits, tutorials, and so on, this publication features a series of reflections that contextualize participants' experiences and the impact of the Institute on their teaching and their students. So these are questions for the presentation. First, how did participants engage with existing OERs, especially digital collections as a shared knowledge base? How did the Institute structure facilitate collaboration and how have participants built upon this foundation to co-create course materials? And finally, how might OER development be sustained through ongoing crisis and constrained resources? All right, so the image that we have here is from a newly loaded newspaper issue, the Dominican from Dominica. And some of the most used items in teaching are newspapers. So how did participants engage with existing OERs, especially digital collections as a shared knowledge base? Collaborators explicitly plan the Institute so as to utilize and promote existing digital collections. The Institute intentionally shared the selection of existing digital collections, including the Digital, Li digital Library of the Caribbean, also known as DLOC, the Diaspora Project, the Dutch Caribbean Digital Platform, and Chronicling America. While Chronicling America is focused on American newspapers, including Puerto Rico, the papers include stories from and about the Caribbean. In addition to these, participants also shared information about other collections they're familiar with. 
the Institute presented both its platforms and the material they contain as OERs, ready for reuse in the classroom. Indeed, in working with our broader community of practice before the Institute, we realize that many teachers identify open access primary resources as OERs in and of themselves, because they are foundational to creating equitable courses and assignments that may be shared back with the community. For example, one early list of OERs in DILOC is the list of Anglophone Caribbean novels published before 1950 by Leah Rosenberg. Rosenberg first shared this list online in Deluxe in 2012 to assist the library and technical teams in locating and prioritizing digitization of important Caribbean novels. Rosenberg then updated the list in 2014 and 2016 to reflect newly identified items and to add links to newly digitized items. This list has been a frequent starting point in discussions because access to primary resources is a critical concern for teaching Caribbean studies. In fact, this list helped to spark a conversation on collaborative teaching, which, while enabled by technologies in the digital age, were insufficient unless shared text could be available for all students. With access to core primary text made possible and promoted through Rosenberg's list of novels, new conversations emerged on collaborative teaching and teaching with digital collections like DLOC. These conversations led to a 2013 distributed online collaborative course called Panama Silver Asian Gold, Migration Money and the Making of the Modern Caribbean, which saw updated iterations in 2016 and 2017. These deeply collaborative courses informed development and goals for the Institute. Instructors frequently note that the core obstacle to teaching is the lack of access to primary sources. And while many teachers readily share syllabi and teaching materials through their teaching communities, access to primary text is often beyond the abilities of any single person for enacting change to enable access. This is why the Institute was designed in a way that would enable participants to familiarize themselves and connect with digital collections, built through the work of many individuals, communities, and institutions as OERs. Our experiences leading up to the Institute affirm that we most often will not hear from people teaching with OERs from DILOC or other sources. As a matter of fact, we regularly need to reach out to teachers to request syllabi for review in order to evaluate the use of OER. Part of this is due to the demanding workloads for teaching, and some of this is due to communication needs, as teachers do not necessarily use the term OER. Explaining the request can therefore require a bit of translation and time. With the sudden move to remote work and teaching with the pandemic in 2020, we have heard anecdotally, I'm sorry, on the increased use of DLOC and other online resources in teaching. However, work to collect and review inclusion in syllabi remains pending. So the photo here is of the Institute participants. The Institute's sympathetic and flexible approach to pedagogy provided a supportive network for participants to share educational resources and envision their humanities projects in new ways. Many participants in their interviews responded positively to their hands-on experience working with digital tools during the Institute and learning from a diverse set of member projects that showed how courses, assignments, and research could be translated for digital platforms. Further, interviewees were interested in engaging in digital humanities, not only to engage student and, and research projects, I, research participants in their classrooms or the field, but also as a set of methods and tools created more, that created more collaborative opportunities and greater access to learning technology among under-resourced communities and institutions. Overall, there's a shared interest in applying digital tools for educational or public outreach purposes and it's reflected in contributed websites, maps, online exhibits, and timelines. Participant reflections also expressed that experiencing the Institute as a cohort fostered a sense of community among members that encouraged further partnerships. We see much of this continued collaboration and contributed co-authored course syllabi developed by members with similar research topics and teaching disciplines, like Caribbean literature and history. So the image you see here is a map of the Caribbean. Many people in the Caribbean and Southern US are familiar with maps like this one for home hurricane tracking. 
I remember these maps printed on paper grocery bags so that we all had home maps to be aware of and to prepare for approaching storms. So as we reflect on how might OER development be sustained through ongoing crises and with constrained resources, two disasters, the COVID-19 global pandemic and Hurricane Dorian took a major toll on the personal and professional lives of institute participants and their students. The impacts of each have persisted long-term, demanding adaptation to new modes of teaching and exacerbating historical inequities in students' access to technology. Participant reflections report course delays and challenges for students in completing coursework. Of course, we cannot know the full extent of personal trauma and grief among the community of Institute participants as they have carried on in teaching and leadership roles over the past two years. Dorian especially affected participants living in the Caribbean, particularly those based at the University of Bahamas North Campus, which along with materials in the campus library was destroyed by the hurricane. These participants, Juliet Glenn Callender and Sally Everson, were not able to undertake the course project they had originally planned. However, both were able to implement alternative assignments that engage students in co-creating digital public humanities resources. Both contributed to Everson's online course, Climate and Inequality, where students created a Zotero digital library and undertook community-based research to document stories incorporated into an exhibit developed in partnership with the Rutgers Humanities Action Lab. Of course, hurricane and attendant issues such as climate change have long affected the greater Caribbean. One Institute guest expert, Shiloh Esprit, described the impact of both Hurricane Erica and Hurricane Maria in just three years following the founding of Create Caribbean. This program, which takes a for students by students approach, invites interns at Dominica State College to teach technology workshops for K through 12 students and to develop digital scholars, scholarship research. One major project, Kara Seedland, engages students in developing regional resources that actively support or raise awareness about sustainable development in the era of climate change disaster. The damage Maria caused to Dominica and to the Create Caribbean space forced a period of rebuilding and compounded existing access barriers. However, Esprit and her students moved forward with support from local and global networks. These examples reflect how recent disasters have made the development of OER and digital pedagogical models both more challenging and more immediately urgent. The burden often falls on individuals to create course materials, sometimes with limited resources or institutional support. As described throughout this presentation, an emphasis on collaboration and co-creation with other educators, with students and across institutions surfaces again and again as a response to community educational need through ongoing crises. This need was also motivated has also motivated a more ambitious vision for the Public Institute website, which complements teaching resources available through DLOC. While many Institute participants were able to contribute materials to the community website, we know the gaps in the collection reflect the obstacles of COVID in particular, with materials collected during the pandemic's peak from mid-2020 to early 2021. With a commitment to sustaining the website long term, we hope to continue building on this project to assess the OER needs of a wider Caribbean studies network and to implement effective and ethical ways of sharing. And so on this, our final slide, we have an image of the National Endowment for the Humanities logo um, with their grant funding making this work possible and a photograph from the Digital Library of the Caribbean of a carnival mask. And this is a photo by Lowell Fiat. Thank everyone, thanks to all of you for your time today. And of course, thanks to all of the participants in the Institute who contributed to the OIR site. And thanks to the, National, the US National Endowment for the Humanities for funding this work. We invite you to explore the OER site and to continue to share and grow OER as built from and as digital collections. So thank you both to Laurie and Helen for offering their reflections. It was really fascinating um, presentation. I'm sure there will be plenty of questions afterwards. Please, if you do have a question, uh, submit this via the Q&A function at the bottom, and we'll be asking uh, Laurie and Helen uh, these questions at uh, towards the end of today's session. So please do submit your questions via the Q&A function. So our second and final uh, speaker today is Jordi Padilla Delgado who will be speaking about the LGBTQ plus memory in institutional and community archives. Um, this uh, paper that 
Jordi will be offering is only a small taste of the research work that has been developed jointly by the Archival Science and Records Management School at the Universitat Autonoma de Barcelona and Loret del Mar Municipal Archive in Spain. Um, so now um, I will hand over to Jordi and his paper, LGBTQ plus memory and archives, power, community and intersectionality in difficult times. Hello and welcome to this presentation, LGBTQ plus memory and archives, power, community and intersectionality in difficult times. Until very recently, public institutional archives, municipal, regional, national, had been unable to include the voices of women and minorities in their discipline. Archives are firstly a political reality. They reflect in their organization and mechanisms those of the dominant political power which, in our case, is characterized by being, among other aspects, racist, classist, cis-heteropatriarchal, macho, nationalist, anti-nayer and concealer of minorities. In this work, developed in a, the joint framework of the Kurds, Archives, Human Rights and Gender Perspective by Archival Science and Records Management School at Universitat Autonoma de Barcelona, uh, and the program Archives and Intersectionality by the Redemar Municipal Archive, we will try to approach different points of interest about the dialectic process that is established between institutional archives and community-based archives, while we are looking for the lost uh, memory of the LGBTQ plus community in both. Well, now we pass to study the LGBTQ plus memory and institutional archives. Institutional archives do not pay attention to LGBTQ plus memory until 1970s period of feminist and gay movements expansion. As Stephen Maynard explains, it is the constant activism of the associations in the political arena that opens the door of the academy. In this process, we find two main obstacles. The first one, sexual minorities have not only been anonymous, but have simply become invisible for documentary production and historiography. And in second uh, point, in the rare cases in which documentary production related to the LGBTQ plus community is observed, these documents have been hidden, declared inaccessible or directly destroyed. This situation has evolved uh, through the past of years. In all the cases, the role played by LGBTQ plus people in documents is that of subjects sanctioned and stigmatized by political power. Since the implementation of feminist and gender studies, however, institutional archives are also adopting the role of collectors of documentation related to the struggle for LGBTQ plus rights. Here we have two cases, one in a national archive and another referred to a municipal archive that can be taken as an example to imitate on this topic, both in Britain, the National Archives and London Metropolitan Archives. The National Archives, or TNA, has undertaken the approach to sex-affective and gender and minorities related documents from different spaces on their website. They have a total of 358 research guides in help with your research section that cover a wide variety of topics and issues. In 2012, they published the one entitled Sexuality and Gender Identity History. It lists the documentary series held by TNA likely to contain data and information about the LGBTQ community. It also presents recommendations on how to search, what terms and keywords to use in your discovery search engine, and what series are available online. In the same sense, you can find a list of documents identified by TEM closed in 2013 and prepared jointly by a team made up of two groups of LGBTQ volunteers, one from the TNA staff, ARCAS, and another one from the Ministry of Justice, Ministry of Justice Rainbow Network. 
in a project that can be considered as an example of best practices of archival and community activism for the dissemination of LGBTQ plus memory from and by institutional archives. The list is available at TNA's Your Archives and includes links to the digitized documents. Other LGBTQ plus history resources can be found at the Archives Media Player section, the blog, and the Education Virtual Workshops area. On the other hand, TNA manifests a general perspective and vision about organization and staff through three instruments Equality and Inclusion Policy, Equality Act, and the creation of a LGBTQ plus staff group. For all these, no other national archive worldwide has the same achievement level on this topic and they become a model to follow undoubtedly. In the case of municipal archives, this same role is played by uh, London Metropolitan Archives or LMA. On their website we find a research guide in the collections catalog section that under the title Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual and Transgender Community Archives at LMA provides us with a list of the documentary series of the municipal administration in LMA that may include references to the LGBTQ plus history, private collections from individuals or associations and kept by LMA are also included. Another interesting resource provided by LMA on this topic is a blog specifically dedicated to the LGBTQ plus history in London through the documents. The project ran between 2014 and 2016 with the title Speak Out London Diversity City. Since July 2020, LMA has been running another project on intersectionality between sexual orientation and race in archives in collaboration with the Archives and Museum Service of the London Borough of Haringey. The project, called Haringey Vanguard, promotes the creation of an oral history archive on the local LGBTQ plus community of Afro-Caribbean origin from 1980 to the present day. We have already talked about LHA in the historical review on queer archives. We can consider them a typical community archive and documentation center managed by a foundation. The guiding principles emphasize the independent character of the entity and the implementation of community-driven archival practices far away from the academic orthodoxy, building a kind of archive of feelings, as said by Anne Kvetkovic. A second model uh, of uh, community archives is found in the archives that compile documentation and artifacts without having a physical location in an exclusively digital way. A good example is Digital Transgender Archive, or DTA. As is explained in its website, DTA aims to increase accessibility to the history of the transgender community by providing an online hub for digitized historical materials, digitally born materials and information on archival resources worldwide. Despite not having a physical headquarters, the project management is located at Northeastern University in Boston. It was born in 2008 thanks to an initiative headed by academics K.J. Rosen and Nick Matt, and currently brings together the collaboration of more than 60 institutions and entities. Its methodology is that of virtual reunification, defined by Ricardo L. Panzelan as the process of assembling and gathering physically dispersed funds and documents in a virtual way around the subject or theme. Okay. And now we are following this classification in a third uh, step, the blocks. This is one of the most widespread modalities about digitally collecting the existence of the LGBTQ plus community. Some of these blocks call themselves archives and also serve as, as virtual showcase for consulting digital documents. One example is LGBTQ game archive Driven by Adrian Shaw of Temple University in Philadelphia, it defines itself as a curated and researched collection of LGBT content information in digital games from 1980 to the present. The use of term archive here is ambiguous, as is admitted by the block itself, expressing in all its dimension the conflict 
that often arises from the use of the word archive in community initiatives for the compilation of LGBTQ memory. On the one hand, the community feels a justified suspicion towards institutional archives given the long tradition of invisibility and documentary repression. On the other hand, community knows and wants the power of evocation and the solid and well-founded memorial identity connotation that the word archive has. And we have a fourth level of uh, community archives. This is the social media networking. We find a good example in Lost Gay Melbourne or LGM Facebook group. Studied by Australian academic and investigator at Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology Rokova in 2017. It was born in 2017, this, this same year, to collect testimonies of the LGBTQ community experiences in the city since 1900. The collection of material is based on interaction with the user, who upload the digital or digitized materials directly to the group. At this point, some of us could wonder if it can be considered really an archive. Is any set of documents an archive? If we stick to academic orthodoxy, an archival treatment would be required beforehand to be able to consider it as such. However, digital virtual environments and the very nature of community documentary collections require and favor archiving practices outside the usual regulations. Practices in digital media make archiving an activity that is part of the daily online experience, in the words of Rob Kova. Another question is how to preserve this virtual legacy. Okay, to conclude the presentation, here we have a proposal of considering LGBTQ plus memory inside a more inclusive intersectionality program to be run in, at a small municipal archive. In fact, this is the real purpose of the study, to put into daily archival practice strategies and tools for that. The SAEMLM, the institution which we are part of, works servicing at the same time as an institutional municipal archive in Seaside Resort Town of Lloret de Mar, in Catalonia, Spain, a regular population 40,000, but 200,000 in the summer, and as a community archive focused on local associations. The treatment of LGBTQ plus local memory is going to be coordinated in an intersectionality program that aims to study and take this issue from an archival point of view following four main sections. One, women and feminism. Two, race and migrant people. Three, sex affective and gender minorities. And four, functional diversity. Sections one and two has been recently displayed and now we are working on sections three and four. On LGBTQ plus community as on the other groups, we must wonder what strategies and tools can institutional archives develop to recognize in an adequate way its reality and experiences. Here we have a first proposal. The design and implementation of archival policies that are consciously aware of invisibility and marginalization of sex gender minorities in the intercourse of other situations like race, social class, religion or ethnic origin and the adoption of a gender perspective. First point related to collections and documents acquisition, processing and dissemination, but also related to all participant agents, users, stakeholders, staff or government. These policies can materialize in different ways, best practices guides, inclusive archival description tools, transforming archives as safe spaces to LGBTQ plus community, applying the queer polar lens defined by Lizette Cepeda to look over documents and collections we kept. In second place, as the National Archives and London Metropolitan Archives have done, creating and developing easily accessible LGBTQ plus sections in archives websites where to find a list of related documents and collections. In the third place, establishing dialogue and collaboration with associations and community organizations by offering the archival facilities, services and knowledge available to them. Uh, the fourth place, interacting with LGBTQ plus community groups in the digital environment through blogs and social networks with 
specific initiatives. In the fifth place, dedicating special attention to the dissemination of the LGBTQ plus reality through archives across different age population segments, towards teenagers and young people, and also recovering the hidden history that resides in the older generations. And in the sixth place, considering an orthodox archival practices inspired by community archives activity, from ephemeral collection to formulas such as artistic residencies or philosophical studies with a gender perspective in the archives. Thank you very much for your attention and have a good, bright day. Thank you, Jordi. And if I could now invite uh, Jordi, Laurie and Helen to uh, put on their cameras. Thank you colleagues for questions. Please keep these coming in via the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. So if um, Jordi and Helen, you'd like to uh, like to join us too. Thank you. Firstly, thank you so much for your papers. There's so much is buzzing around my head. There's, uh, there's many different areas of potential questions and interests. But just as colleagues are, are thinking of their own uh, questions to submit, maybe if I could start with a general uh, question. Both of your presentations have cited the importance of working really closely with communities in co-creation of materials and establishing meaningful dialogue. And that's something that came out through, through both of your uh, pieces. And although both of these uh, projects predate COVID, obviously they have been running across a period of great stress. There's a lot of interest in this sort of the work that you've been doing uh, amongst colleagues in the UK. So just to start us, could I ask a question is, are there any sort of top lessons that you've learned over the last year or so of engaging with a variety of communities around these meaningful dialogues around uh, co-creation that you think are really the, the top points that you'd want to share with the UK audience that you would think will be will be most important? And maybe if I just turn to you, Laurie and Helen first, and then go to, to Geordie. So it's interesting because um, during COVID or not during COVID, um, some of the, the core principles of working with um, community partners I always apply. Margaret Kovacs' book, Indigenous Methodologies, is perhaps a, a best primer on this, um, but it applies with working with any partners. Um, you want to make sure you're really in the spirit of mutual aid, understanding that you're working together for a shared goal. Um, and so you may have other individual goals that are separate, um, but how do you make everyone speak together? How do you make you know, our voices in harmony? How do you make sure everyone's supported? We have um, in academia, there's a, too much of a history of extractive research practices, treating partners as subjects. Um, and so always that's horrible, you know, and that doesn't make sense. So really a spirit of mutual aid, mutual respect. How do we build something together? Um, and some of the, the simple things like you'll hear from um, different researchers like, oh, I, I published, you know, a paper. I did this study of a particular bay of the ecology of it cool. And did you share the, that paper with the archive that helped give you all of these materials and that really partnered with you and, you know, helped frame your research and directed you to different other researchers, um, you know, on the island or anything? And often they'll say no. And that's a huge misstep. And so we also need to be part and within our institutions of making sure people are, have good research practices that are, are truly collaborative and supportive. But Elen, did you want to add more? Um, uh, I'm just trying to think back to the past year and a half. Um, I'm trying to think about the lesson learned, but I think for me, um, one of the positive thing about the whole pandemic is that it actually forced us to communicate better. Um, and, um, you know, like I know we are all zoomed out and everything, but w w again, one of the positive aspects is that it forced us to have these meetings and have these discussions. And um, because we were all in this together, it also created a huge community of support. Uh, and that to me was one of the big biggest lessons learned is that we had to communicate with one another and we had to adapt very quickly and we had to support one another. And so that that's the biggest lesson. So, yeah. Thank you. And Jordi, any, any reflections from you? Yes, uh, I agree with, with Laurie and, and Helen. Uh, in, in that past year, uh, we, we are a small municipal archive. We have learned that uh, we are at the same level that community. We can not um, talk to the communities, no lessons, no, we are all at the same level. 
and uh, we have to share no, uh, our knowledge on archival science in our case with community and um, making available all, uh, all our uh, resources. In, this, in that case, especially in, through the virtual and digital uh, ways, because um, in the last year, 90% uh, of access and, and consults here uh, have, uh, have been digital. Uh, that's uh, really a huge amount of, of digital interaction, uh, digit, digital engagement with, with community. And, and we have to be very close to, to communities to, to know their, their, their necessities, their needs, their needs also, uh, and to, to know the way we can uh, uh, share e even considering their uh, archival practices. Uh, maybe someone uh, can uh, think that these practices are not academic, but they are useful, and we can consider that as a, as a useful resource also. Thank you, Jordi. Um, so we've got some uh, questions are continuing to come in and please do keep submitting them via Q&A. So we've got a que question for uh, Laurie and Helen. This is from Liz Fulton. How did you help support your participants on a more personal level during COVID-19 and Hurricane uh, Dorian? So uh, how do you support your participants on a more personal level? You're on mute, Laurie. Sorry, I thought I even clicked it. <laughs> um, so some of the, depending on timing and depending on um, how the different devastations, not so often hurricanes, um, but there are also, you know, earthquakes, volcanoes, other things um, that we all deal with. Um, but the with Dorian, it was a bit different. Uh, so many people had evacuated from the University of the Bahamas, the North Campus, which was, um, uh, which uh, was the one that was most devastated. Um, and so, Normally, it depends, you know, different storms are different. Uh, sometimes we do like mail different relief supplies, you know, you're looking at sending books, other things. Um, I've definitely been on, hey, we're all going to a conference here. It's after a storm has passed. You know, we need additional gauze, you know, in your bag. Here are the things that we expect you to pack because we know that you're going to buy books while you're here. And so, you know, um, the mutual aid in the Caribbean, well, one of the things that you'll always hear as soon as someone's like, okay, we've got a storm going, everyone's tracking it. Um, and then you'll hear once the storm has passed, okay, ships are launching from Trinidad. My brother's on that ship. My cousin's on that ship. They're going to be there, you know, in this amount of time. And so you actually, like I've traveled for professional conferences to one island, but that has not been affected, but people know that they're going back to the other island that has been, or they know where the mail ships are running, um, or they know their brother or their cousin with a different power and light. And so you have a lot of like really personal things that you send around. Um, we always have the deep wealth um, and well of mutual aid. And so in terms of like how we send each other different books, we make sure our books are you know accessible online to um, books and other materials accessible and preserved. This is the work that DLOC was born to do. You know, we know that no one island can do it on their own, no one uh, partner. And so we always know the next storm is coming, you know, and the next storm and the next storm. Um, and so within that, that deep, you know, approach of solidarity and we're all together, how do we be there for folks? I mean, we check on them, you see how folks are doing. Uh, we ask what they need. And we know that the ongoing work continues unabated. And this work is so critical to meeting our needs. Like, how do you tell the story of the North Campus of the University of Bahamas when so much of that doesn't exist anymore? That's the criticality of our work on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, yeah, I'm not sure that <laughs> that fully answers it. And I don't know if you have more a different way to add, but I mean, really it's, it's solidarity and mutual aid and the, the constancy of the ongoing work. Um, but there are other things, I mean, calling and checking in, also knowing like, hey, I'm here if you need me, but I'm not gonna keep checking on you because we know that you've been through this and and yeah, um, Elena, I'll let you talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I don't know what else I can add, but I think that uh, first of all, a lot of the participants were also on social media and posting about their experience and are still posting about their experience, what it's like being, um, some are in the Caribbean, others are in the US, so a little bit all over. And so posting about their own experience and um, there is a sort of solidarity that has built up through the participation in, in the Institute and afterwards, so there is that support. And I think it's also, um, I would add like bringing understanding that deadlines will not be met, that the projects may not be completed and that it's okay. 
like it's totally fine um so it's also reassuring people that even if things don't happen the way they were supposed to that it's okay and that you know um it's fine if the project cannot be done and it's fine if it's done late. Uh, so bringing understanding. Um, and in addition to that, uh, for us, I think it was also important to uh, not only extend the grant, but also um, like we hired graduate students and it's providing work to these graduate students. And so it's providing solidarity, it's providing understanding. I think this is what I would add to what Laurie already explained. That's really um, that's really uh, useful, and thank you for such a thorough response as well. And that combination between so that flexibility of the project, but also flexibility, and understanding, and approach that colleagues and and and, and friends and, and family in the Caribbean and elsewhere are going through these periods of change, and actually how to be sensitive to that, both you know providing direct support, but also um, some emotional support as well. Thank you. If I may have one more question for uh, Helen and Laurie, and then uh, a question for you, uh, Geordie. Uh, Helen and Laurie, there's a huge amount of interest in the UK at the moment around open educational resources, OERs, and that has been enhanced by the period uh, and the experience of, of COVID and the lockdown of buildings and the needing for the need for learning content um, online. In terms of your experience of creating OERs with, with, with communities, both through DLOC and, and, and other projects, like, are there any top things that you would really want to share and highlight from your experience of creating specifically OERs? You mentioned one issue about capturing their impact and understanding how they're they're being used uh, during your presentation. But are there any other things that you would really highlight as sort of must know or must things that colleagues should be aware of around the developments of OERs with communities? Yeah. So OER is a lot of work, um, but it's tremendously beneficial work. Uh, so some of it, it, like when we talked about some of the difficulty um, for tracking the data, always focus on your area of, of greatest need. So what that can be, is this textbook $400? Or is it that it's so often in Caribbean studies, it's, well, we can't teach the course because we don't have access to these materials that are critical for us. Okay, so if we build this digital collection for you, now you can actually teach a course that you have never been able to teach before in your life and you've always wanted to. And now your students have a zero textbook cost for the class. So we're helping on textbook affordability. We're helping higher education be more affordable. We're helping get your students engaged in a way that isn't a burden on them. That's fantastic. Um, so we found a lot of literary and art classes where people wanna teach these really dynamic classes. They've, some of the cases they've never had access to the materials or the access to them is it's cost prohibitive if you're looking at you know, different um, print editions or even if you're doing a course pack that's like a Xerox setup. And so how can we as you know, cultural heritage uh, providers, how can we fit in with that and make these courses possible, make new research possible? Um, so those are some really high impact ways that we can address it. Ellen? I, I would just say whatever time you think it's gonna take you, is, is going to take double that time. So that's really the main thing I want people to know is that it's it's a lot of trial and error. And I think that that's also something that is important to share is that, you know, you always see the results, but you never really know about how long it took you to get to this beautiful, you know, open education resource. But um, it, it's it's going to take trial and error, and it's going to take more time than you than you thought. Uh, is really my practical thing that there is to know. That's that's great. And, and apologies if I squeeze one more question, and then I'll, I'll move to to Jordi. And that it relates to the demographic of the DLOC team uh, and and uh, the so the, the makeup of the DLOC team in terms of is it made up of a permanent staff from the Caribbean or is it mainly students within the Caribbean and, and what's the relationship between the the the, the library schools um, and the Caribbean information specialists so I guess it's a sense of who who are the individuals involved in in, in this work and what backgrounds are they from and, and what's the makeup in terms of permanence versus versus students as it were. Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so the Digital Library of the Caribbean began of ACURAL, the Association of Caribbean University Research and Institutional Libraries. Um, and ACURAL has always had its home base at the University of Puerto Rico, but it's always been um, throughout the Caribbean. Um, so ACURAL had an IT special interest group and they said, we need a digital library that's for us um, and that we define. You know, we wanna make sure that we retain rights to all of our materials. We wanna make sure that materials are preserved and accessible. Um, and we wanna be able to think with 
it? How do we use this? We build a house and then what else can we do with that house? You know, as we build that foundation and move it forward. Um, and so that was really led by Judith Rogers, who was then the director of the University of the Virgin, Virgin Islands um, Libraries. And so she had, she had three islands, you know, three libraries, three islands. There's a mail boat that goes, or there's a boat that goes between one, but the other is a seaplane or commuter plane. She can't, she couldn't even handle lending. You know, it wasn't feasible um, to have the materials go back and forth. So she was looking at it for her needs. And then how do we do this across the Caribbean? It's not just the Virgin Islands. It's all of us. And with the diaspora, it's really the entire world. Um, so they set out a um, really solid plan for governance. Um, so the different partner institutions uh, are the ones that run the DLOC executive board. There's also a DLOC digital scholarship, or sorry, the scholarly advisory board. So those two boards provide the governance um, and then the partner institutions contribute content. And those, uh, so everyone, every partner institution has someone who is contributing the governance and contributing the content. That That's the majority of the staffing, the vast majority of staffing for DLOC. Um, in addition to that, we do have an executive director, Miguel Asensio, who's based at Florida International University. Um, he doesn't have a library science degree, um, but he has a degree in education. So we have different degrees and backgrounds. We do work closely um, with uh, UE Mona, the, uh, the library and information school there, um, and with uh, University of Puerto Rico. But that varies based on what classes are being taught, when people want people in for guest lectures, what things students are interested um, in, for different projects. It also relates to the digital scholarship, you know, projects that people are doing with DLOC. Um, so very connected, federated, um, not, not centrally managed, um, a kind of relationship and support. And then did you want to say more on that? Because you're also, you've got the French Caribbean network. Yeah. Uh, no, I think you, you, you explained it all. Uh, just that uh, at the University of Florida, we do have um, uh, sort of a DLOG groups, like everybody who is involved in one way or another. We have colleagues working on digitizing newspapers from Florida and Puerto Rico. Uh, I work uh, more, I, I worked with digitizing Le Progressist, which was a newsletter created by, um, whatever, long story short, we have this group and uh, we are all working together. And it's, uh, as Laurie said, it's not like a centralized thing. So it's, uh, uh, it's it's a learning experience for me coming from France where everything is centralized for sure. <laughs> thank you, thank you both. And please do keep questions coming in. They're, they're coming in thick and fast. So please do keep uh, putting those in the Q and A. Uh, Geordie, we've had a, a question from uh, uh, one of our delegates, uh, Claire, and this is about a question about language and um, how the L LGBTQ plus community can reclaim some of the language and some words used that are, are used within the archive that can be seen as offensive. Um, was sometimes used as a term of abuse for members of that community and how through projects like yours members of the community and, 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 and non-members of the community can re reclaim um, that, that language um, as has been seen in, in some work elsewhere. Whether there's anything um, you could say about that and that process? Yes of course when, when the study be, uh, began at the academic level uh, we thought uh, using the, the expression LGBTQ+, plus, because uh, that uh, seems more uh, used maybe uh, by the, the same community. But after uh, the study and uh, during the proposal uh, to the archival practice, we have learned that maybe it's better to use another uh, expression that is uh, sex affective and gender diversity. Because, you know, there is a bit of confrontation between some groups inside the community, the, the sexual diversity community. Uh, some of them were not to be named Q, queer and say the queers not, they don't want to be with LGBT. Okay, no problem. All we have in common is the, the sex affective diversity and the gender diversity, and we can uh, include all in, in that uh, in that expression. But uh, that's true that uh, words matter and language matters. We have to be very careful uh, trying the, the correct words in that sense. 
In terms of some of the, the project, obviously you're now entering stages three and four of your projects. So you're about halfway through. Like how are you, in, in terms of some of the language used within the documents and, and collections themselves, which are would now be, well, and always have been seen as offensive and inappropriate to use, uh, how are you having some discussion around that? Like what, what, what are some of the conversations that you're having about uh, with members of the community in terms of how that language is presented and, and, and potentially can be reclaimed? Well, in that sense, we have not uh, um, had any problem with community. Uh, they are all really uh, agree with the expression uh, sexual diversity and gender diversity, but also with, with the LGBTQ because community, the sense of community is very uh, near to the youngest people, maybe younger people and not uh, to the old generations, to aged generations. It's more difficult for us, has been very difficult to engage with uh, um, people who has been um, into the community, but not out. So um, we have to be careful, really, uh, using the words and including especially that voices also. Thank you. There's a, a, a fantastic question that's come in from uh, Raffaele um, about um, really for both, well, both papers, all, all three of you. And that is the relationship between the preservation of physical um, collections, whether they are, are stories or papers, and also digital resources and how these intersect. So, uh, for example, uh, Laurie and Helen, you brought up the difficulty of making sure that areas suffering from natural disasters are, are, are documented. And, and Geordie, you've talked about the preservation of digital archives that are, are at risk of, of disappearing. So there's really a question here about how these intersect. What is the relationship between preservation of the physical and, and the relationship with the digital and vice versa? And can practices from one be applied to the other? So quite a broad question there, but I think that gives a lot of scope in terms of drawing on what, what you've, you've talked about in your papers. So maybe start with Laurie and, and Helen. So from our perspective, we're doing digital because it's uh, our emphasis tends to be digital because that's often our only actual option if we want to preserve and make things accessible. So many of the materials in the Caribbean and the University of Florida, historically, um, since its founding, the libraries have identified as a Caribbean institution because we're in the swamp. Um, in Gainesville, we're low lying. It's always 100% humidity. Is it ever not raining somewhere in town? Um, and so our materials I, and so many of the materials that we have also from our region were printed on, you know, not as a free paper with animal glues. These are things that even when we have them in a storage facility that is temperature and humidity controlled, they continue to degrade. And so digital is the only way that we can ensure that these materials can be preserved moving forward. There are other materials that we actually can preserve, you know, the materials that, that will last. Um, and so we're always interested in preserving and making accessible all of the materials to the extent possible. Um, with like making sure that materials are, are documented and can be found, it, there's so much work to be done and it's really fantastic and important work. Um, and some of it is you document the loss as well when you can, or you document not known to exist is a, a regular classification that we see um, where things, we, as far as we know, they've been lost um, or maybe they were never actually printed, but they're mentioned. And so then we do different research. We work with scholars really heavily on this. Um, and so, Let's see if I can send this to everyone. Um, one example, um, the Carib, which is one of the earliest um, known in English um, Western West Indian um, literary magazines. So Evelyn O'Callaghan was talking about this. She was really interested in it um, because the editor, Frida Kassen, um, has published some other things. Evelyn has done different um, uh, research on her and also republished. She was really interested in seeing this. And she's telling me, we don't even know that it exists. It's in this one archive that we think it exists um, in Antigua but um, the roof, the building isn't totally stable. We're not sure if the materials are actually stabilized. They don't want to open the box because you don't want to open things even for a researcher to see or to do digitization unless you know you can immediately stabilize those materials because you may lose them at the moment that you open it if you can't stabilize the materials at the same time. So this is always a question that comes up. Um, and one of our questions from that is also, can we find another copy? Um, and so doing a ton of like Googling, searching around, Senate House Library at the University of London 
did have a copy and they graciously digitized it. And so thanks to their work, these materials are now known to exist, at least for some of the issues, not all issues. Um, and they can be researched for the first time ever. And so I think it was two years ago that these were digitized. So, I mean, two years born into the world of like modern research is really radically new for someone to work with. Um, but now we also know that the physical materials are there and the physical materials being there gives us another trace. Okay, well, what else might've been collected and put there that's related to these? It's, it, was it the same librarian doing the collection? Was it um, a particular missionary? Was it a researcher? Was it a um, civil um, employee? Who, how did those materials get there? And what else can we find? Um, so we're always interested in preserving the physical and the digital materials. We're also, interested in seeing what the, the echoes are. How do those relate to the other collections? Um, and when the material has been lost, how do we document that loss? So not known to exist, but here are the gaps, here are the silences that have occurred. Ellen, did you find? What to add? I think you've said it all, but I think uh, I would add that we are also interested, and this is really like a long-term project in, um, um, also making sure that uh, whether it is the physical material or the digital material, that it is discover discover discoverable, sorry, um, in not just English. I mean, I think this is one of the things with Deloitte is that we have material in Creole and we have it in French and in Spanish. Uh, mostly, we don't really have much Dutch Caribbean, I think. Um, but, you know, one of the things that we need to do is also uh, improving like our information and our metadata in a variety of languages. And this is again, like a really long-term project uh, that, that applies to both, but this is, this is something that we're currently working on. Thank you. And, and Jordi, that intersection between physical and, and digital, are there any reflections that you have from some of your work and some of the works that you were citing? Yes, I, I also agree nearly with Gloria and Helen. Uh, we, we have uh, very similar issues here in that sense. Um, when you are a small archive, a small municipal archive, um, even if you have not uh, a, a big amount of resources, you are pretty good preserving physical documents and you know how to do it. But we are not so good uh, preserving digital materials. And now we are learning also. Uh, but preserving physical documents and physical materials is a very good uh, base, a very good uh, point of, of start to, to be a, a good uh, digital pres uh, pre preserver also. Mm, there are many challenges because we, for example, cannot uh, preserve um, websites of associations, it, it's very difficult to preserve a website. How uh, these websites, um, probably uh, in 10 years, in 20 years, um, there will be the same, probably not. And we uh, probably uh, will lost this memory and, and that's scary. But so we have to, I, I think that the, the best uh, way is to share with another association, with, with another um, organizations, other institutions, with academic, with the university, with um, institutions more powerful, more with more resources, and, and to establish uh, partenariat and, and associations in that sense, because it's really uh, a drama. It's, it's uh, losing the, all that uh, uh, memory, especially in the LGBT, in the diverse sexuality and, and gender diversity. I think that is, is, is a good point to, to lead us up to some of our, our final reflections. Um, any, this is a final call for any, any final questions, if people had them, please do, do add them to the Q&A. But Jordi, you've just given us a sort of very uh, sort of rallying cry for collaboration, uh, which is, is obviously at the heart of this conference. Laurie, you cited uh, the digitization with Senate House Library and the, and the potential to, sh to share collections and, and highlight those. As, as we are talking and at the heart of the conference is around catalyst and, and, uh, for change and, and collaboration, are there any final reflections that you would make in terms of how we can better share some of the experiences that you've you've been working on through your projects um, to build up that community that you've just you've highlighted, Jordi. But are there any any tangible things in your mind that we might think for the next four four and a bit days how we might do that and build those bonds and, and, and cement those links um, across uh, institutions internationally? So maybe start uh, uh, Laurie and Helen. 
So ours is a kind of overly, it, ours is very easy compared to many places. Everyone has Caribbean collections. Um, and so the history of the Caribbean is the history of capitalism. It's the history of the modern world. We know you have Caribbean collections. Um, take a look around, see what you have. Um, it would be really, really neat just to sort of think with the Caribbean as you're looking through your, uh, your collections. Also think with that as you're thinking through your communities. We'd love to hear from you directly. We'd love to partner and collaborate. Um, but there are so many other things as you look through your collections with a collaborative lens and like where could we really you know partner with someone else in spirit of mutual aid we could support collections collections that have been lost to disasters collections that aren't accessible for whatever reason if you thinking with those eyes you can see so many different connections and opportunities for collaboration internationally obviously we'd love to hear, hear from you for the Caribbean um, but the same speaks to so many different groups and communities I would say um, now that you know about DLOC and maybe you already knew about DLOC or on our website um, as well, um, let us know if you're using our collections, let us know if you're using them for a project in the classroom because we love to hear from that and we love to highlight the project that are using our collections. Um, and even if you're not using DLOC, whatever collection you're using for your project, let, let people know um, because I think this is the best thing that there is to do is that we want to hear how our collections are used. So this would be my 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 little thing to say. And Jordi, I think the final comments are yours in terms of how can we build collaboration between us? Yes, it's, it, Helene has said it, let to be known. We have to, to we have to, to go outside the archives, outside the institutions to to spread the the, the preserving of the memory. Um, because the community uh, needs us. That's the, that's the fact, and, and we are for, for them. So uh, maybe if you have not the resources, it's more difficult, but you have to go to the streets, to the communities, and uh, asking communities, hey, we are the archive, we are the library, we are the museum, what, do you, what can we do for you? That's, that's the question.